Welcome back to the channel, guys. Hope you're all doing really well. Today, it's a new interview with Dr. Mike Isertel, the co-founder of Renaissance Periodization. I've mentioned him here on the channel multiple times. I'm willing to bet most of you guys know who he is, but if you don't, he's just an overall really smart guy. He's a PhD in sport physiology. He's a competitive bodybuilder, a professional Brazilian jiu-jitsu competitor, and overall just, like I said, really knowledgeable guy when it comes to hypertrophy training and training and programming in general, all right? So just really excited to have him here on the channel. We talk about mainly mistakes that are made in training and in programming. We also get into squat depth, what the proper squat depth is, and variabilities in different people, and also cheating reps and how they're not good at all for you to do, and we get into a whole lot of other things. So without further ado, guys, hope you enjoy this interview. Great, I'll take that jump and uh, uh, announce the first thing is I I, um, I don't think I can do justice to an inclusive ordinal ranking of top five, which means, you know, I, I, I'm, I can say five mistakes and they're probably up there in the top 20 of the ones that I could compile if I had time to sit down and make a list. But so these aren't necessarily the top five, All right. but there are definitely five things that people do often and they're not that great. So, the first one, and these are not in order of importance or anything like that. Let's see, what mistakes do people make? Uh, I see one is, uh, so for beginners, I'll make a very general one. People make the mistake of not setting specific goals of what, they, what it is they want out of the gym. Not even like, oh, I, my goal is to lose 15 pounds of fat. It even goes down to the session and exercise level where they'll go in and they'll do stuff that other people do. And uh, if you ask them why they're doing that, they're not so sure. And you ask them, what about compared to alternatives? They're also not so sure. And you ask them how this fits into their grand scheme of what they want out of the experience, summated over multiple sessions and weeks and months. And there, there's still some people aren't very sure, which is okay but is a mistake in the sense that if you were more certain about what's going on, you could make sure that you were actually achieving your goals in a more efficient manner. So for example, you know, you ask someone who is bench pressing, a uh, beginner, very beginner, they go in and they bench press. Is that, why are you bench pressing? And uh, a lot of times they'll be like, well, it's just, uh, hits the upper body. And I've actually heard the bench press described as the, the core upper body lift. Now, ask, I saw your, Joseph, I saw your confusion in your eyes. You know, there's an entire pulling complex that's just entirely uninvolved in the bench press. So at best could be described as half of the core of the upper body lifting. Uh, so it, a lot of times people just bench because people bench and that's just what they've seen other people do. Um, and, you know, they'll do exercises that target various regions of the body. Sometimes they're not so sure. Um, another example, a classic of this is I used to see people when I was uh, in the university setting for a long time, too long of a time, uh, JK, uh, both as a student as an, and as an instructor, every August when fra fra new freshmen would come in, you could automatically tell who used to play high school football and no longer played football because they weren't going to the collegiate level. And that's people would do things like hand cleans and power cleans in the gym. And probably 90 something percent of these folks, if you really sat them down in, a, in a, a private enclosure and asked them really, really though, why are you in the gym? The real answer would be to build a kind of physique that increases my probability of engaging in sexual relations that I find valuable. Now, hand cleans, as far as exercises that get you laid, you know, at very, at very best indirect. And at yeah. worst, the stimulus to fatigue ratio there is comical. Um, so, but but they didn't think about it. It's just some move they did in high school football, and they're doing it now. So I would I would urge maybe not urge it's a strong word. I would encourage beginners to really think through like when I go to the gym, what muscles am I targeting? Why will this give me the results that I want? And you don't even have to be correct about it. You even have to have a good plan. It's kind of the difference between in a horror movie, someone running out of a cabin of, of you know ghosts, 
and uh, going and running and telling the friends, go, let's run, run, run. They're like, where are we going? Like, we're going to the, the, the street. It's two miles down, but there's a street with traffic lights and businesses. If we make it there, we'll be safe. Maybe they're wrong about the direction they wish they're running. But they at least have an idea of where they think they're going versus just running out of a cabin in the woods with ghosts and just just going and someone's like where are we going and you're like i don't know and there could be a canyon there there could be other ghosts there could be werewolves where you know at least have an idea of what you want out of the process and is what you're doing at least theoretically getting there i would say is a big overarching mistake and it's not a mistake in the sense that we can blame people for it it's just a lot of people just kind of do that you know Mm -hmm. but um i think sometimes people assume that it's the generality of fitness which they don't assume for a lot of other purchases and expenditures of their time like when you buy a TV, you kind of know how big your TV you want. You know exactly what you want to do. You want to watch Netflix and Amazon on it. And, and that's just, you know, you know where you want it mounted. You know what prices you're going to go for, what you're not going to go for. You know how big it is to fit it into your house, so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of times people go in the gym, and this isn't just college students. I mean, you have 40, 45-year-olds coming in, and they go to a personal trainer, like, I just want to get, you know, fitter. And it's like, gee whiz, you know, if you just admitted to yourself why you're really here, which is, again, to have the kind of body that gets you laid more, or at least looks like it can get you laid more, then we could we could really just target that and go to town. And a lot of times people have these sort of admixtures of ideas. They're like, well, I kind of want to get strong. I kind of want to look the part. And then they're sort of powerlifting, sort of bodybuilding, and they're doing triples on the bench and their shoulder hurts. And they haven't really thought through, like, do I really need these triples or do I just need kind of a sexy chest that gets the ladies and the boys looking. So I, that was a long-winded way to, to answer that one. But, <laughs> no, no. Um, I think that was a great answer. Um, like, I see you're wearing a T-shirt right now that says, I can just read the, the partial reps. Yeah, partial reps don't count. I've seen you wearing that. So I feel like that, and I know you've said a lot about it, that's something that, you know, I think would be discussed here. Like, a lot of people think that you can get away with partial reps in a lot of stuff. Like they see IFBB pros doing partial reps and then they think that they can then therefore do that and they'll get bigger muscles doing it that way when in reality they should be doing full range of motion, right? Yeah, so I would actually say that's easy number two, easy number two. Um, and as a matter of fact, if you have any mistakes you think are worthy, just tell tell me right now and we'll make this ch- chat a lot more efficient because I could either disagree with you and say, I don't think that's top five, which is unlikely. You'll probably write about it. Or I could actually expound on why it is that I think, yes, I agree with you. So before range of motion, things of fame. Now to be very perfectly clear and technical, partial range of motion training is, is quite effective. It does result in gains, pretty good gains. The problem is, is that it's stimulus to fatigue ratio just isn't ideal. Um, and it ends up being that you're doing a lot of work and grunting and using a lot of weights and presenting a a decent chance of injury for fine results, where with full range of motion, you could humble yourself egotistically, but then get slightly better results more consistently and have less of a chance of getting hurt. Gee, you know, it really is kind of better. It's it's almost the difference between, uh, I'll, I'll say this, I'm comfortable saying this, putting ketchup in your pasta versus pasta sauce. Like, will you starve to death putting ketchup on your pasta? No, no one's ever done that. Uh, starve to death doing that. Not, not to say that no one's ever put ketchup on their pasta. Um, but uh, you know, is it a quality leap above for someone who's hungry to taste pasta sauce with pasta versus ketchup? No, like if you're starving, shit, ketchup sounds great. Whatever, I don't care. Like post-contest bodybuilders, if you give them ketchup on pasta, they're like, this is amazing. Why did I ever yeah. think of this? Three days later, they're like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. But uh, so it meets all the needs calorically and everything and checks the boxes, but like you just have a better, more sustainable long-term experience if you use pasta sauce because you're like, oh man, it just it just hits the right spot. Now here's the thing: ketchup's way cheaper than pasta sauce, so you might not want to take it off the shelf. And in just the same way, the sort of cost of uh, partial reps, uh, ignorance aside, is uh, and I don't think it's ignorance, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a sec. I think it's it's almost entirely down to ego, and here's why: um, if you let females go into a gym and just start to look, read the machine labels. And, you know, I have like dildo guy on there doing the whatever, mm-hmm. read the label and do that. Mm-hmm. Females will uh, probably eight times out of 10 do full range of motion. And males will two times out of 10 do full and eight times out of 10 do partial. And you think, you know, gee whiz, you know, why is that? Males and females are psychometrically pretty much identical IQ wise. It's not like male and men are that dumb. Um, and then you think, you know, what is the big difference? And 
And uh, females do not express their ego as much through lifting. Uh, like a female, when she lifts a really big weight, doesn't typically as often look around and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just like, oh, that was cool. And I'm getting results and I love the process and I like the community here at the gym. And my friends are cool. Uh, whereas guys really just desperately want to lift as much as possible to impress firstly themselves and secondly, anyone else who's watching. Mm -hmm. So that's really the number one reason behind partial range of motion lifting is just ego because you get to lift more weight. And also it's not as painful. So that combination of like, I get to lift weights, not that challenging, but it looks more challenging. Jeez, that's a, that's a good sell for partial ROM. Like if you were some company in a mystery alternate universe advertising partial range of motion lifting, like, do you want to look more impressive, but work less hard? Like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> Just do half reps. And the thing is half reps fool most people in the gym. Um, I remember getting into, I was lifting at the Jewish community center in Metro Detroit. And there was a guy there squatting five plates on a side. And uh, it was like, it was legit. Joseph, it was a fucking quarter squat. Like, I'm not joking. I'm not being ironic. It's, it was a quarter squat. Like in the physical sense that it was one quarter deviation from where he could have gone, which is in the real world, you think, oh, like, okay, it's not an eighth squat, but like a quarter squat for real, for real is like embarrassing. It's like, what are you doing? And he barely bent his knees and then he came back up. Then I had an old Jewish man turn to me and look at me while this guy was doing that young kid. He was like 19 and the old Jewish man was like, I don't know, a thousand, however old old Jewish men are. And he turns to me and he's like, oh, that's really impressive. And I, I desperately wanted to be like, no, it's not <laughs> like. Come on. But, yeah. but you know, I, I didn't uh, want to be mean. I was like, oh, yeah, I did one of those. Like, mm, mm, so it is, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, it works. It works. And, and the thing is, it works all the way down to the pro level where all the way up to the pro level, rather, where, you know, people will lift um, uh, in professional bodybuilders. And then you got like infinite guys just in line. Am I allowed to swear and make obscene references here or would you rather I didn't? No, go for it. You got a ton of guys just in a one long line, just putting their lip gloss on, ready to just blow the dick of every pro that's just doing these partial reps. Like, yeah, book works for the pros, bro, and you ain't shit. Like, yeah, have you ever talked to that pro? It's not that smart of a guy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Some pro bodybuilders are very intelligent, very thoughtful people. John Jewett is a great example. John Jewett does full range of motion. Strange. I know it's a mini yeah. IQ test. Now, not to say all partial range. Here's the funny thing. Uh, C-Bum, Ian Valier, T Matt Jansen's guys, Nick Walker, Big Ramey, Hottie Chupan. By the way, this is the top five of the Olympia this coming year. They all fucking do full range of motion now. So now you're, it's, you're out of date, even if you say that. But for years yeah. and years and years, and for many people still to this day, it really does work. Like, oh my God, he's using eight plates. So that's really the number one reason people do partial range of motion. And again, it works, but it doesn't work as well. And it's just way more annoying and way more likely to get you hurt. And, and that, that's the bottom line. It's really just ego. Well, I mean, I think I remember like in the past, especially as, as social media took off and a lot of people got into following their favorite bodybuilders, one that comes to, comes to mind is Branch Warren. Like he was infamous, I think, for doing partial reps in o almost everything he did in his training. Like, like even the military presses he was doing, like it was, I don't even know if you could call it even a partial rep. Oh, it was, I remember. Yeah. So... You know, I think, Farms remembers. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people see that and thought, oh, because he's uh, looking amazing, whatever. And he got uh, in at second at the Olympia that, that year or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that therefore I can do that too. You know, and I think that's, uh, and you can, you, know, you can, and it works yeah. for branch. There's a difference between worked and worked optimally, you know, like, and, and, and here's the thing. The optimal part is I can understand if someone said, look, you, you do gaming on your laptop. And you're like, I do. I play video games. It's fun. They said, well, yeah, that's not optimal. What you need is like a third generation AI processor and huge screen and VR goggles. And then you'll really be optimal. Well, that shit costs money and it costs technical expertise to even pick the right thing, which is a big downside. Thing is, there's no real downside to full range of motion training other than killing your ego. But fuck, is that a big downside? So you can automatically say, it's like, okay, so why are really people interested in this? It's because they already wanted to do partial range and then the bodybuilders just justified it to them. But if a bodybuilder start doing full range and they are more and more are doing more and more full range of motion training, you know, you still try to cling on to the guys doing partials because man, forearm just sucks and it really hurts the ego and it hurts your muscles. 
Uh, so that's why people still do it. And, and, and they're running out of heroes, which is good. Um, and I look forward to the day in 10 or 15 years, maybe if the society looks like it does today and we still bodybuild of almost all bodybuilders doing more full range of motion. And then it was going to be comical to look back and be like, oh yeah. Like it's like, you know, in the eighties, people took like beef liver tabs and I was like, what you did. And if you said it doesn't work, they'd be like, well, all the top guys do it. Now you come up to the top guys and you're like, do you think beef liver tabs? What the fuck are you talking about? No, it's, it's, it's stupid. So I can't wait for it to get out of date. Now, I mean, how many of these guys, I know you've actually talked about this a little bit yourself. How many of them do you think have not actually, like IBB pros, have not reached their actual full genetic potential because they're cutting themselves short in terms of the range of motion? Or would it, do you think it really would make that much of a difference when they're up on stage? Not that much, 10 or 15%. But 10 or 15% at the Olympia is the difference between being 10th and being first. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's also the difference statistically of being nothing because you got hurt and not getting hurt and being something. Right. So it's a big deal. If anyone wants a, an almost perfect illustration of what you can get out of full range of motion training, or rather another illustration of this is what you don't need to do in order to get big is to look at how Nick Walker was training before he hired Matt Jansen as his coach and after and Nick Walker's a strong motherfucker. He was doing like five plates plus on the Smith machine for partial reps, which is done racking that shit is damn near impossible. Mm -hmm. Super fucking strong. Now he goes through much more full range of motion, quality contractions, especially in upper body moves and hamstring stuff and, and shit like that. And all of a sudden he's using like weights that you're like, really? You built that body using those weights? But through a full range of motion under a lot of control, that's all the weight you need. And now like Nick Walker's probability, just like prima facie, like looking forward of injury is really low. It's, well, how is he going to get hurt doing what? Like able flies for sets of 15. Like nobody gets hurt doing that with proper technique. And, and he's way bigger and way leaner and way better shape and way more proportioned and his waist to state small. Uh, you know, a lot of that's due to other reasons, but that full range of motion training is what sort of like builds the fertile soil to build that other shit on top of. And if you do partial range of motion training and, and stuff like that, you could be putting yourself at injury risk and just the stimulus to fatigue ratios are off. So, so here's an example. Someone could say, man, you know, there's no way I could train legs twice a week. People say that all the time. And then I'm like, why? And they're like, because it beats my knees and back up too much. I'm like, uh-huh. You teach them how to train with full, full range of motion. They're like, oh, I can train my legs two times a week. No problem. It's my knees and back don't hurt. I'm like, ta -da. I've actually heard bodybuilders say, like one in specific back in the day said, you know, squats are the ultimate ass builders and knee destroyers. And, and I was like, yeah, like if you don't know how to squat properly, yeah. absolutely agreed. But that's because there was sort of a received wisdom of the way you squat was, you know, maybe two thirds of the way down at best. And that's just how it was. Yeah. Well, how, here's a question for you. How necessary do you think it is to actually even squat? Cause I've heard a lot of people like Pat Davidson, uh, Jordan Shallow, they've all kind of stated. Never like, heard of you never heard of it? Yeah. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> I mean, uh, Pat Davidson, he's a real bastard, I know. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's uh, he's talked about how, you know, you don't even need to squat at all to even make good progress in in hypertrophy. So, you know, what's your opinion? Do you agree with that or do you disagree? Well, I generally agree on principle. Uh, you don't need any specific lift to make good progress. What you need to do is stimulate the muscle well. And preferably if you can stimulate, the, so, so you need a certain raw stimulus magnitude to get the most growth. And ideally, if you ratio that raw stimulus magnitude to the fatigue generated, and that ratio is as high as possible, which is to say you get the most stimulus for leaf fatigue, then you could do an even better job. Um, and there are plenty of exercises for the quadriceps, for example, that have good stimulus to fatigue ratios, leg presses, back squats, and, and then the list goes on, many, many machines, different variations of squats that aren't the barbell back squat. And so you don't need to squat, but what I would say is um, you just pick the highest stimulus to fatigue ratio of raw stimulus magnitude exercises, and then whatever those happen to be for you, assuming you're do, doing due diligence to try to do all the movements technically correctly, there's a lot of people say, and, and these guys that you just listed, they're not examples of this, but they say, oh, you don't need squats, don't do squats. You look at how they used to squat, and you're like, I, could, I, I wouldn't do that either. <laughs> your, mm -hmm. your squat technique sucks. So if you're doing due diligence to try to actually optimize movements and doing them properly, then you find that some are just stimulus to fatigue ratio is just way better. You don't have to do the poor ones. And if squats happen to be poor stimulus to fatigue ratio for you, I wouldn't do them. For me, I'm like kind of designed to squat. So squats to me are just unreal, both great raw stimulus magnitude 
and a great stimulus to fatigue ratio, but I use a ton of different movements. And sometimes nowadays I'm, uh, I don't almost ever squat fresh because I'm strong to the point where, you know, like I don't really need the injury risk and the axial fatigue on my back. So I squat as a second exercise after some pre-exhaustion kind of quote unquote for quads. Uh, so I, so I would say that that's the best way to do it is just go by based on what's best stimulus to fatigue ratio. Now, if you do that, you do realize that you can say to people, yeah, you don't have to squat, but if you take that to the extreme, which again, these, these guys, the Pat Davis and George Shallow don't do that, but you, but you can't take it to the extreme as some other people do. And I've heard people say, and this is something that's been brought to my attention very recently, <clears throat> you know, compound movements are a bad idea. You should do isolations only. And to me, uh, you know, the real question is, can you generate enough raw stimulus magnitude for a muscle, you know, with isolations? And the, the answer is yes, for some muscles and just no for others. You know, if I said to you, hey, look, you got to get your quads as big as possible. Your tools are exclusively sissy squats and leg extensions go. Most people would just not get the kind of disruption and tension through the quads that grew them optimally. Of course, they'd still grow, but you know, you could have a completely busted up back and still do sissy squats and leg extensions as hard as anyone else. But for some reason, most people that have a busted up back have weaker legs than you would think. And they were like, well, I can't train my legs hard because my back's so fucked up. But there's truth to that. It turns out that when your feet are flat on the ground and you push through your quads uh, in a compound fashion, the amount of intramuscular force generated by the quads is fucking high because it's a stable movement and it's a compound movement, just like in, in dumbbell pressing and bench pressing and machine pressing, you can probably generate more force with the pecs than you can in a fly motion because there's some inherent instability there and your body's like, mm, I don't want to tear myself in half today. So isolations in many cases are just inferior on raw stimulus magnitude. Now, if that's not the case for you, look, if you get on a leg extension and you just squats and it just blows your quads up like crazy, and when you're doing them, you feel such insane tearing tension on your muscles. Hey, fuck it, fuck it up. Fuck squats and leg presses. But in my experience, the experience of most people, a nice flat footed with sold, you know, Olympic weightlifting shoes, deep leg press and hack squat. It hits your quads in a way that is no amount of leg extensions do. Uh, and it's just something to it. So I think that if you go based on stimulus to fatigue ratio, that hard compound pushing with your quads can be derived from other exercises than squats. But I wouldn't rule anything out until you tried it with good technique and then just see where the chips fall. Okay. Uh, now, I've made actually a video on my channel before, and this is something that you might actually uh, disagree with a little bit. So I made a video on how important is squat depth in general. Not so much whether you need to squat or not, but the, the depth for it. And my argument was that it's not as important as people make it out to be. And the reason that I stated that is because of how everybody is a little bit different. It all depends on exactly what your goals are, what you're training specifically for. So like if you're, and you've seen this video, I think you made a post about it. There was a video of uh, one of the uh, Browns players squatting and he was barely hitting like a quarter squat. And you know, something like that is ridiculous. Yeah, that's not good depth at all. Um, but in terms of the depth that somebody like an F NFL player, especially like an offensive lineman, I made the argument that they shouldn't be going down to full depth because of their, um, the, uh, the forces that were put on both their hips and their knee joints, since those are already beaten to hell from playing the sport. So that's an argument that I made for that. But if you're somebody like you or me who's training specifically for hypertrophy, then yes, in that case, I think full depth would be beneficial. But you know, overall, what I said in that video was that it really does depend on who you are and what you're trying to train for. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I mostly agree with that, though I, I could have some questions back, some food for thought. Mm -hmm. Is it really true? that the knees and hips receive more force in a full depth movement than in a partial depth movement because we have to compare equated loads. So your five rep max to depth is much lower than your five rep max to halfway down or two thirds of the way down. Right but now we have to compare five RM to five RM. And then all of a sudden the vertical forces going through your hips and knees are actually higher uh, when you're doing the partials, then you're doing the fulls. Now the translational forces can be potentially lower, 
but also maybe you're designing athletes to try to handle those forces uh, that go in other directions. And maybe that's good to train them for that. Now, I think typically in sport performance, what you do is you try to take the task specificity that they encounter on the field of play or in the court, and you try to build that kind of range of motion at least into the training, and then potentially also more range of motion to make sure that if they get out of position, they still have mobility in that region. And I think that is it, you know, if I have uh, NFL players that have really long femurs and short torsos relative to their height, if they're squatting to completely Olympic depth, is that such a big deal to me? No. Would I like to see them go below parallel? Most of them can and get real great benefits out of it. Um, and actually it enhances the stimulus to fatigue ratio of their squatting training. So I'm not like everyone has to dunk it all the way, but the assumption that going partially is better for joints connective tissues than going fully is to me not clear, at least on first pass. And as a matter of fact, in the rehabilitative sciences, expanding a joint to its full range of motion and the ability to produce uh, strength and stability through that full range of motion of the joint is kind of a core tenet and core goal of rehabilitative processes. So for saying rehab, they do it. So why are we avoiding it in real training? And I do think I, I agree there's, it's pointless. Like if a, a player has real nasty mobility issues, getting into like a true a Bulgarian depth Olympic squat is maybe not worth your time to push it or worth their potential injury risk just because they're so immobile. But I would say get them as deep as they can still produce lots of force and maybe a little deeper than that so they're nice and uncomfortable. And then you're doing real good stuff. Most people, that means they can probably squat all the way down. But if you have exceptional cases, NBA basketball players, sometimes you go for as much as you can get. Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, to clarify, I would say, you know, if you're like an NFL player, I, I would like to see at least parallel and maybe even a little bit below, like you said. Sure. You know, but... That's already what most people consider a full squat anyway. You know? Yeah, yeah, I would say. You know, I think um, especially since they look into the powerlifting world, that's what they do for competition, and therefore I think people try to translate that into everything else. You know, um, but one thing I would um, say is that, again, with like an offensive lineman or a defensive lineman, one argument that I've, I would make is that you know, not going down necessarily full range of motion like Olympic style, in part because they're never actually in that position when they're playing the sport, apart from the center. So the center is often in that position, but the other offensive linemen and defensive linemen, I would say, are rarely ever in that position. Ideally, if they if they don't get knocked down or if they don't fall or if they don't slip and warm right. foot than the other, which actually now it happens all the time. So you want to prepare athletes in the weight room, not just for the typically experiencing statistically, but the outliers of that, at least yeah. a standard deviation or two outside. And then all of a sudden you're pretty damn close to full range of motion and everything uh, because yeah. athletes in sports get put into positions they're not normally accustomed to. And if they're accustomed to them in weight training and they're strong in those positions, they probably won't get hurt and they can power out a real awkward position. But if you train them only to exactly the statistical average of the positions they take, then any deviation outside that average in play and, and practice, which will occur, is going to put them right. into a slightly compromised position. So uh, now uh, they, they don't go so far. So to your credit, yeah, look like, you know, we're not trying to get these motherfuckers to lift out of the splits and shit like that. Like right. some people go way overboard. And they're like you have to, if you don't hit full weightlifting style depth, you're you're going to get destroyed and your body's going to break. I don't think that's the case, but I think we need to build a kind of an insulative barrier. Uh, a margin of error into range of motion. And that's what the gym allows us to do really well because we can't so much prepare for that stuff on the field of play. Uh, it's difficult to put players intentionally into really bad positions, but you can right. do it in the gym. If you're doing it well in the gym. When you get put in a bad position, you could be totally fine. Like one time I was uh, I was rolling with uh, Chad Wesley Smith, actually, we were doing jiu-jitsu together, which is like, you know, Mothra versus Godzilla kind of battle. And I passed his guard and he physically picked me up and flipped me over. And the only way I blocked him from rolling me was I physically just did a one arm whole body press off of my one hand. I weighed 245 at the time. I actually did pull my tricep just a little bit. It's a twinge that went away after like a week. But I was like, holy shit. The thing is like, was I preparing for that in jujitsu training? Fuck no, that never happens once out of a million times. Nobody's strong enough to do that except for Chad Wesley Smith. But because I was lifting through a whole range of motion, that to me wasn't an alien position. And I think there's something to be said for that. Not everything to be said for it, but something. Yep. So, I mean, to give you actually an example for me personally, I have kyphosis. So because my back is rounded over a bit more in exaggerated fashion, squatting with a barbell is often not actually optimal for me. 
So like I can't get into a super deep squat because otherwise I'm leaning forward like this, you know, yeah. and I can't really do that. So I used to squat a lot and I would be able to go down to about parallel and it worked for me, but I honestly haven't actually squatted, barbell squatted in months. Um, you know, so I've substituted in, you know, leg presses, hack squats, lunges, uh, split squats, a bunch of other things like that. And it's all worked for me. So I think, you know, it, it really does come down to the individual and, yeah, and, you know, what their, their goals are and how their body actually works. Agreed. 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 So... You know, getting back to a little bit in terms of the mistakes, do you think there's any difference in the mistakes made between beginner, intermediate, and advanced? I have at least one more beginner mistake to share, by the way, but I, okay. I, I absolutely will. Uh, let's let's answer this first because I do think that this this podcast will probably go no further because of what I'm about to say. It'll probably go no further than to just refocus back on beginner mistakes. But uh, so let me explain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think that the way people categorize beginner, immediate, advanced, and I've actually made a few YouTube videos about this, is sometimes they're speaking across purposes at each other. Um, advanced generally means that you're experienced with lifting and you're now more resistant to increases in your ability to do it. Uh, and also that you maybe have facing more risk of injury and overreaching and stuff because you're kind of closer to your body's adaptive limits. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're a more deep thinker or know your body much better because I've actually, so for example, I had a, a client once specifically comes to mind in New York. His, his specialty was maxillofacial surgery. That's what he did for a living. So, he, you know, if you get in a car accident and fuck up your face, he fixes it for you. And not, not a person who is lifetime athlete or anything like that. And he's uh, of, of Korean ancestry. And uh, the first time I ever showed him how to do a squat, he hit a squat that could be on the cover of Iron Mind magazine, like 1988 Olympic weightlifting special. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Just completely upright torso, deep as fuck, heels on the ground. And I was like, uh, all right. And so that guy was literally a beginner in the sense this is the first real squat he'd ever done his whole life, but he would already be on the cover of a textbook. So is he, is he a beginner? Like, yes but he's making no mistakes. Like, holy shit. So, and then you got other guys who've been lifting for 20, 25 years, some pro bodybuilders who, if they had to teach a person a squat, if they had to teach an undergraduate exercise science class how to squat, most of the students would start mumbling and be like, is this guy for real? What the fuck? Like, the textbook it says he's wrong. Right. <laughs> so advanced, you like, you know, who's advanced? Is it the guys that are more jacked and lifting for longer? In the sense that they're probably facing some adaptive resistance, sure. In the sense that they're more accomplished, definitely. In the sense that they have some nuance, understanding, maybe, uh, maybe not. So I think advanced mistakes are probably the way I would describe them as, as mistakes made by people who are already thinking very deeply. And then so I would list a whole other list of misunderstanding auto regulation, be, uh, trying to be excep exceptionally precise with, with uh, technique, uh, you know, sort of misunderstanding the nuances of programming, uh, overvaluing the, the role of frequency and training, and the list goes on. But all those are boring and real technical, which is fine. And I love talking about that stuff. But the thing is, the, the fraction of the population that, that is committing those mistakes is tiny. And it's way smaller than you would think even by, by, by who jacked. Like, you think, oh, pro bodybuilders make these mistakes. Like, no, no, pro bodybuilders, some of them don't even know what frequency means. You have to be like, number of times you train a muscle a week. And they'd be like, well, it's one. And you'd be like, could it be two? And they're like, why would you do that? And you're like, okay, so you've never thought about anything. Great. You just do this and you yell a lot. Sweet. So I would say the vast majority of these beginner mistakes are just mistakes that even quote unquote advanced folks make. Uh, so I would probably, you know, we can't absolutely get to advanced mistakes and intermediate mistakes and stuff like that. I have lots to say. So like an example of an intermediate mistake would be, uh, not deloading or not deloading sufficiently, right? Like beginners, they might not need to deload a whole lot. Like they go on vacation with the family twice a year and that's good enough. Right. But, um, so, but I think it, it really pays to at least make the point I just did, which is that a lot of quote unquote advanced people still make beginner mistakes. And the vast majority of mistakes made in the gym are beginner mistakes. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think that does make sense. And I, I think um, that's actually not something I had really thought about a whole lot in terms of you, you can easily think that because they're advanced, they therefore know what they're doing. Um, and therefore they can't really make as many mistakes as beginners again. But, you know, after you said that, it makes 
absolute sense that they have these habits that they've drilled into themselves over the years, and then therefore getting out of those mistakes is going to be a lot harder for them than if you're a beginner. Sure, even even I'll, I'll give you one level up higher, or even the desire to get out of the habits, or even the recognition that they are habits, or even the recognition that they're doing something that may not be optimal. A lot of people just do stuff. Like, you know, there's probably someone that uh, knows a ton about cars that watches me fill up my wife's Subaru with like 87 gasoline or whatever. They look at me like, really, 87 for that car? Like, do you not know what a fucking Subaru engine block is? Like, you should be doing 89 or 91. I just be like, eh, like, really? I don't even know what the numbers mean, man. I know it says octane rating. I, I, I so nominally understand what octane is. Uh, what? And I, I look like an idiot, but like my car runs fine, I think. And I don't have to know. And a lot of times you can get real far not knowing some shit. That's really nitty gritty details. And so a lot of quote unquote advanced people aren't really advanced at all. I'll tell you this, and I don't want to say too much here, put myself in a corner, but I have a... Uh, one of my one of my life's simple pleasures is to watch Jared Feather, one of my best friends and coworkers, and IFB pro bodybuilder, talk to really really jacked bros at the gym. And as Jared uh, has two speeds, he has ultra smart guy speed and not so smart guy speed. But uh, he's not always as uh, how do I say charitable and switching speeds for people. And when 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 Jared's in the Jared mood, we call it Anakin Skywalker mood. He will just say what he thinks down to the technical details. And I just watch people who thought they were advanced and new stuff just don't have any idea what any of the terms he's saying are. Like he's like, well, you know, in order to stimulate a hypertrophic response, and he's speaking at this at this speed, and they're like, what stim? What hyper? What? What the fuck? And you, like I would just be like, and he would normally, if he was in a good mood, be like, you know, to get muscle growth. <laughs> But mm -hmm. you would think that these folks he's talking to, I mean, these are like the next most jacked people in the gym next to him. You would think, oh, they know all these things. They don't know a fucking thing. Like a lot of them do, but some of them just don't. And a lot of times people look up to their favorite top bodybuilders, jack guys in the gym, even if, forget the pro bodybuilders, just the guy in your gym that's really jacked. Or if you come up to him and ask him how to train chest, you would think that he knows something. And you know what? Like half the time, you'd be correct. He definitely knows some things more than you. But the other 50% of the time, you may walk away from that conversation reeling. Like if, if I, you take a kid off the street who's been lifting for two months and just watched like, you know, 30 Jeff Nippard videos, probably knows more than the average bro training for mm -hmm. two years. Like from legit, they just straight up knows more. I would hire them to be a personal trainer faster. Um, and, and, and that's like, that's the way the cookie crumbles. So a lot of times like this, this notion that these people are advanced and they make advanced mistakes, like that's not how that works, man. The regular, they're kind of regular people that just have great genetics, take plenty of drugs and they're consistent and they go hard. And with that, you can build 90 some percent of your physique that you ever will. Uh, should you be teaching people how to do shit? Fuck no, especially if they don't have good genetics. Oh my God, you're damning them to like injuries and no results at all. But when you have good genes, it's difficult to miss. So can I say my, because we're probably running into some time stuff. Can I say my last thing that I have to say is a beginner mistake? Of course. I actually give you some value on this podcast outside of me <laughs> ranting on technical, technical details. It's all um, cheating. Cheating. Using swinging and momentum and oom um and ah. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a thing. And it's just like the partial range of motion. It all stems from the same tree of ego. The only reason to cheat, if you really think it through and really do your research, is ego. There's almost almost never a good time to cheat. And the, boy, oh boy, do I get some you know clap back for this on social media when I say, yeah, I post my little text post and I say, cheating is probably stupid and wrong. Gee whiz, you get 40 comment red replies of, well, what about this pro bodybuilder? He does it, blah, blah. What about the biomechanics of eccentric loading? A lot of times folks just haven't really thought it through that much. At the end of the day, man, cheating is a real stupid idea because if you look at it just from a base level of analysis, let's just take the, the curl. If you're swinging during curls, like, you know, someone could ask like, you know, Asperger's kid at the gym who just says what he thinks. He could be like, why are you training your glutes? I thought it was arm day. And you'd be like, ah, well, you right. see the glutes, they help the, um, Hmm. He's right. right. He's fucking right. Like you train your biceps, just train your fucking biceps. And also there's like a tracking problem where it's like, I got, you know, 13 reps today with 95 pounds. 
well, how many of those reps were decent reps? I don't know. Like they sort of got shittier all the way through. And the next week you get 14 reps with hundred pounds. Did you get stronger? Maybe, or maybe your technique was shittier. So if you have swinging, cheating bullshit, you don't even know when to cut off the count. It's so funny too. Cause like some bodybuilders, some a lot will post videos of them doing some curls or some whatever lift, they tricep extensions and the, the, the technique gets progressively worse. And then mm -hmm. at some point, which to me seems rather arbitrary at times, they decide that the set is over. So it'll be like, try some success. Uh, 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 and then they'll stop and be like, oh, that was tough. And I'm like, I want to be like, why did you stop then versus five reps from then? Because I say you reached technical failure 10 minutes ago. And <laughs> what is really the cutoff there, right? And right. if you don't have a standard cutoff of good technique, not only are you like you know making excessive amount of fatigue to muscles that have nothing to do with the fucking tricep extension or the curl, like if your abs are sore after triceps, Jesus Christ, or if your fucking glutes and lower back are sore after curls, what are you doing? And another one is injury risk. You know, you're taking an isolation movement and exposing it to eccentrically controlled forces that are way higher than your biceps. Like if your biceps can't lift the weight, you're expecting them to maintain structural integrity when they return the weight. Mm -hmm. And and there's ex real examples of this, like Callum von Moger, I think, um, who did that like partner curl with somebody else. I forget who. Um, maybe it was Sebum. Uh, and they did like 405 pounds on a cheat curl together, and he fucking tore his bicep. Like, mm -hmm. what fucking exactly was the point of that? Right. Uh, you know, cool. But the expense of your fucking job, you get paid to look like you do. Now you're tearing muscles to do what? And, and, and people say, well, that's crazy, but a little bit of cheating is good. And, and uh, it's one of the, my favorite things to do. And it doesn't feel good to do, but it's, it's, it's almost like seductively. It feels like it feels like a sin. I don't really like to do it, but I end up doing it anyway, like scrolling on Insta for too long and you're not sleeping. Like you want to do it, but you know you shouldn't. Is mm -hmm. asking people like a series of investigative questions uh, uh, with questioning their assumptions. They say, well, you know, um, a lot of cheating is bad, but a little is good. And you go, interesting, why? And, and a lot of times what they present at you is notions, which philosopher and economist Thomas Sowell would call notions, ideas that aren't even structured in a way that makes them hypotheses. They're not even propositions about how the world works. They're just kind of like intellectual vomit. You got to take the vomit you get a few razors here and you clump it into something that you chop up and maybe looks like something, but they say things and then you're like, oh, can you explain that? And a lot of times when they have, you know, when they don't have per moments of honesty, which is totally understandable, social media is kind of toxic sometimes, they'll be like, oh, you know, fuck you, you don't know shit, you're an asshole, you look like shit. Okay, respect, I get it, we all get offended, so do I. Right. But, so, <laughs> but sometimes in, in moments of honesty, especially in DMs, they'll be like, man, huh. Well, I guess I really don't. I don't know why. I guess maybe you're right. Maybe there. Maybe there's no good reason to cheat. And then they go, there it is. There it is. Yep. So that's my thoughts on cheating. Yeah. I mean, one thing I've seen in a lot of programs is they'll program in. Let's say you do 12 to 15 reps, good technique, full range of motion of it, and then it'll tell you to do an additional five to ten cheating reps after that. And to me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because I feel like it just increases your risk of injury immediately after you just did an actual good set. And you know, you, your st uh, st uh, stimulus to fatigue ratio all of a sudden just went to shit because you, yeah, you had a good stimulus to fatigue ratio because you did 12 to 15 good reps and now all of a sudden you want to make it that much worse and it never made sense to me. To put, to put like, ah, my lower back still feels good, I see. I won't have this on my watch, take that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but yeah, at the end of the day, one of the funny like little sort of Thomas Sowell style retorts is uh, why not just do another set right. of good technique? And gee whiz, you know, most people just don't have an answer for that shit. And then sometimes they'll say, well, we want to actually take the opportunity to overload the muscle and continue to have mm -hmm. it close to failure. And then why don't you just do a drop set instead of curling 100 with shitty technique for 15 reps, 10 of which were good, five which sucked, why don't you stop at 10, take away from 100 to go to 60, and then do five really good reps, same accomplishment of uh, continuing the exercise into the failure zone, but without all the risks and downsides and the ability to crack it. Because then you could say 100, X10, comma, 60, X5, parentheses, no rest. Mm -hmm. And then next week you can do, you know, 11, comma, seven reps with 160 or whatever. But if you're cheating, I mean, you really just don't know what's going on. And uh, one last thing before I shut the fuck up finally. Um, Cheating can put you into this position where, look, we all care about numbers, right? Like, let's be honest. We all care about, like, how much we leg press and fucking bench and squat and curl, even fucking lateral raise. 
And if you cheat and you start cheating and your technique gets wacky and you're writing down the numbers you're doing, like guys will even say like, I handled the eighties today for an incline. Like what the fuck does handled mean? Like accomplished a number of sequential good technique reps. Like, well, no, none of that really happened. Um, it, it's like saying you talk to a supermodel at a club like, there's a difference between like, she was like, yo, when are we leaving versus like, hello. And she's like, get the fuck away from me. And you're like, I've successfully talked. That's a kind of conversation that counts. Like, aliens were watching be like, he's conversing with her. He succeeded. Like at the end of the day, it puts you into the position of you, you know, you wrote down 315 for three in the bench, but what you really did is 315 for one. And then two of them were dog shit where your buddy's putting his balls in your face and you're doing half reps. If that means next week you're going to try four or are you going to try 320 for, for three, but you never did 315 for the, And then what's going to happen? Your technique's going to degrade even more and more and more. And at some point you realize you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. And you're going to renorm the technique. If you're decently thinking about it. And you go back to square one. We go back to 275 pounds instead of 315. You do a real good set of five reps. And then you can one of one of two choices. You can continue to try to make good reps happen so that you only need to renorm once every several years. Because uh, sometimes all the technique or mind muscle connection at least gets away from all of us. Or you can just do the same stupid mess cycle over again, where you go 275, 295, 315, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And you need to renorm back down. And it's all a clusterfuck. So another great thing about good technique is you don't have to worry about like, am I really doing this? And you don't have to get addicted to leaving heavier loads that you actually never did to begin with. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that that makes absolute sense. So uh, I know you're uh, running out a little bit of time here, so I think it's a good place to uh, uh, stop here now. So I appreciate it, uh, Dr. Mike, you know, you coming on, giving us all your wisdom for today. Um, oh, it was great. But believe me, it was definitely good wisdom. Fair words. <laughs> yeah. The children are going to watch this. You should feel ashamed to have me on. No, nah, no, nah, don't worry about it. They need some uh, culturing. Believe me, believe me. Culturing. We'll call it that. I'm comfortable. We'll call it that. All right. You know, I, I really do appreciate you uh, coming on, taking the time for that. And I appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much. By the way, your living room looks very lovely. My Oh, thank uh, you. This, the, the CIA says I can't leave this room until I do a certain number of podcasts. So I'm, I'm here to stay for a while. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. I'll let you know when that's thanks on so my much. channel. Everything. Super. Thanks so much. All right. Bye.